We've heard a lot of inspiring things about uh, artificial intelligence and the hope that it brings for many things. Uh, but my, it's not my role. My role is to pour water on all of that and really try to drill down in terms of what artificial intelligence, and especially in its recent incarnations uh, with advances in deep learning, what it's going to mean uh, for those of you who have come here with the intention of saying, just finding out more. You may have had a CEO or a board come and say to you, you know, go buy me some AI, I hear it's really great. Uh, but then what do you do? Then what do you do? And the first thing I'm going to tell you is it's going to turn out that artificial intelligence for all our uh, enjoyment of it in popular culture and our imagining of it in the future, right now is just an advance in statistics. It's a really significant advance, but that's what it is. And that turns out, when you strip away the hype, it turns out that you can really think about what artificial intelligence is going to mean for you and how to use it. So in other words, I'm not here to hype artificial intelligence and to help it sell, but I'm here to help you sell yourself as someone who can use it. So I come from the University of Toronto, and where I have seen all of this developing is through a, a program we have called the Creative Destruction Lab, which is probably the largest concentration of artificial intelligence and machine learning startups in the world. Uh, we've seen literally hundreds of them dealing with all manner of things, including most recently a program that has been surprisingly successful in quantum machine learning. I have a book, Prediction Machines. I'm, of course, here to sell it. <laughs> Why wouldn't I be? Uh, but the book is going to, I'm going to give a little bit of overview of what its theme is. So, what the current wave of AI reminds me most of is the feeling that we had in 1995 when the commercial internet was born. It became widespread, Netscape had its IPO, etc. And as economists, we have a particular way of looking at things. Uh, there was hype in 1995. There was a lot of discussion of the new economy. And the new economy was one where Everything had been rewritten. Everything was going to be different in the future. We couldn't rely on what we'd learned from the past. So everybody thought the economy was new, everybody except economists. When we looked at it, we thought, no, this is the same economy. This is the laws of supply and demand working as they always have. It's just that there's been a dramatic reduction in cost. In this case, the cost of sending digital information globally around the world had suddenly dropped to zero. We've seen this happen before. With semiconductors, you know, from the 1800s all the way up to the present, we see a curve looking like this. Mild progress followed by massively rapid progress, uh, and then uh, it's uh, flattening out after that. What was that progress? It was in, you know, other people, technologists like to hype performance so that these graphs look upward sloping. Economists, we're downers, so it's downward sloping. We're equally excited, but it's downward sloping because it deals with a cost. And what cost got reduced? The cost of arithmetic. Basically, all the computers do is do better and cheaper arithmetic. Now, once you identify with a big, drastic technology what the cost of the thing it is reducing, and there's always something, you can use that to work out what to do with it. In the case of semiconductors, the first thing that happens when something gets really, really cheap is you use more of it. So people were doing manual computation of artillery tables. Well, now all that could be automated and done more cheaply by the machine. We were adding stuff to work out our accounts. We could do that. We worked out. We knew the rules of the games. We were able to code them. You could do games and better games. We could use it then to send messages, electronic mail, to each other. And then we could do some surprising things like digitize music 
and use and distribute that as well. That actually was surprising to people at the time. It actually wasn't surprising to Ada Lovelace, who actually wrote about that possibility back in the early 1800s. And then finally, we did it with pictures too. And this had an entire revolution. In other words, so we started from things get cheap, you do more of that stuff, and then you find that problems that you didn't even think were arithmetic problems could be converted into that, and you could harness that technology for them. This is happening with artificial intelligence. You get typical diagrams like this. It's a bit hard for me to understand. So we like to put it in this format. What is artificial intelligence reducing the cost of? OK, we just started to get that cost reduction, which is what the hype is. And the answer is, it's reducing the cost of prediction. What artificial intelligence currently allows us to do much better than we did before is better, faster, and cheaper prediction. And we still have to run our course on it. It's only just the beginning. What is prediction? Prediction is where you take information that you do have in order to generate information that you do not have. Okay? You might take pick uh, information of past observations of something to forecast the future. You may take information of how people have classified photos and use that to predict how somebody would classify a new photo showed up that was shown to them. And so we're going to see the same things occur. If we make something much cheaper, we're going to see it used more. So we're going to see an expanding range of use of that input prediction, which is an input into decision making. We're going to have more predictions and these tools being used for things like loan defaults. Banks and other lenders have always tried to forecast, to predict whether somebody will default on a loan. Well, that's a good place to apply machine intelligence to do it much better and more cheaply and more nuanced. We will do it for the pricing, of in pricing and assessing of insurance risk. We will do it for medical diagnosis looking at an image and working out whether a tumor, tumor that is there is more likely to be malignant or not, or any other na uh, uh, version of that, and maybe taking in far more data to do it. We do it for object classification, working out which is what, and we've even started to now find new applications that we didn't think of as prediction problems in autonomous vehicles. As was uh, mentioned in a previous talk, autonomous vehicles were, were actually de developed decades ago. That's because we knew what we wanted the vehicle to do. It's very easy to know what a vehicle should do. That's the easy part. The hard part was having it sense its environment so that it would know which environment it is so that it could do the right thing. When you're teaching a teenager to drive, they know to stop if there's something in front of them. You're screaming at them because they didn't see that that object was moving in front of you. Prediction. And what's going to come into the future? We don't know. We didn't know with past revolutions. What we don't know when we get a reduction in the cost of something is what's going to turn out to be a problem that can be solved by that thing. That's still a job to be done. Prediction is valuable because it's a key input into decision making, and decision making is everywhere. We are making decisions all the time. That is why this is potentially transformative technology, because it is a key input into something that is so ubiquitous, how we make decisions. Often we even avoid making decisions because we do not have the information to make something nuanced. So there's a lot of scope for expansion. But prediction is not the same as decision making. There's work to be done in the interim. Just to see how that is to the uninitiated, I, I couldn't find a similar one for coming today. I had to look too far out. But in a recent talk that I gave in, in Toronto, people were traveling on a Friday, and they might have looked at an app like this to see whether they could carry an umbrella and see that there was a prediction of a 55% chance of rain. Now, uh, for me, 55%, uh, way above my threshold, I'm definitely carrying an umbrella with that. Uh, of course, I carried it today because it was England, and I assumed it's always above 55%. <laughs> but with a more fine-grained prediction, what you can get is you can drill down. 
and you can drill down like this. And you can see that the likelihood of rain was not over the course of the entire day. It was actually at a specific time after 8 p.m., which was way after when people were traveling for the conference. So in order to have a, the decision, and it may not be the greatest one in the world, whether to carry an umbrella or not, having a more fine-grained prediction allows you to move from a blanket rule, I'll carry it if it looks like it's going to rain tomorrow, versus, uh, to one where uh, it's more nuanced, where I'll see, is it going to be raining, likely to be raining when I happen to be out, when I'm expecting to be outside. So you move from what Herbert Simon calls satisfying to optimizing, and that's where we get the productivity gains from AI. Now, the final thing that I want to mention is one of the things you can do when you identify that a technology is all about reducing the cost of something is you can roll it into the future, and you can imagine what will happen if that future arrives today. In our case here, there's a thought experiment we like to do which thinks about what happens if you dial up the quality of prediction in a particular circumstance. And the way we think of that is so, so, as a dial, literally turning up the volume. Imagine that a company like Amazon was able to dial up the volume of prediction. What would it do to its business model? So currently, your typical Amazon page looks like this one, where you search for stuff, you search or shop, click on things, wait a day or two, it's getting less, but you have to wait some period of time, and it gets delivered to you. So you have shopping, then shipping. Well, that's the basic mode. That's the workflow that's uh, existed forever. Well, what if you take that process and you take this volume and you dial it all the way up to number 11? Sorry, let me come back. What happens if you do that? What does that mean? That means that rather than just knowing uh, that people who bought this also bought some other item to assist you in your shopping, imagine that, app, uh, that Amazon can tell what you are likely to want, even before you've thought about whether you want it. Okay? It, it knows its profile of you, and it can predict perfectly your demand for a range of items. Well, then it can flip the business model. You can come home, there'll be a box sitting there from Amazon. I don't remember ordering anything. You open the box and say, dental floss. I just ran out of dental floss. There could be other items as well. The only thing stopping Amazon doing now is uh, that now is you don't necessarily want these things now. But if it can actually predict, and I agree, it sounds like science fiction, into the future, it can change the business model. And so instead of you just shopping and thirst for Amazon stuff when you need it, when it occurs to you, you'll come home, there'll be a box there, and most of it is stuff you need. Other stuff you can discard, but if there's so little, Amazon isn't going to worry about those returns. And to Amazon, of course, it gets great advantages because it happens to be there right then and there, which uh, delights the consumer and gives it uh, a leg up off on the competition. And as I said, this might be science fiction, but in 2013, well before we even started thinking about this book, Amazon filed a patent for exactly that. So what's the moral of all this? The moral of all this is there is a process that you can use right now to think about where AI is going to impact on your business. What that process involves is identifying key decisions that you make, the range of uncertainty for those decisions, and then just saying to technologists and engineers, do you have the means to resolve that uncertainty? Do you have the data, historical or otherwise, that I can use to train some algorithms? If I get these algorithms, will I have the data to power them? And then, if I imagine, even before I go to that expense, if I have this data, is it going to matter to me? If you never want to ever carry an umbrella, then it doesn't matter to you what the forecast of the rain is. 
But if that decision is costly to you and you want to optimize it, then you know there's some value for that prediction and you know in turn there is a reason to procure somebody to think about whether artificial intelligence can provide that. There's more in terms of thinking about the role of people in this, thinking about the role of strategy and a little bit on the implications for the society that I don't have to go into. And if you happen to find your way into Toronto, of course, because I'm in a business school, we like to, to teach you about it. Uh, and also more in terms of articles at predictionmachines.ai if you want to look at it. Thank you.